Hello and welcome to Backstage Pass. My guest today is the world-renowned lighting designer and Tony Award-winning producer, Mr. Richard Winkler. Hello, Richard. Hi, Bill. Welcome How are to you? Backstage Pass. I'm fine. How are you? Great. Thanks for having me. Ah, oh, it's my pleasure. Richard, you have one show on Broadway at this point, correct? Yes. And that is? Come From Away. Tell me about it. Come From Away is the most life-affirming and wonderful piece of musical theater from a completely unexpected subject matter. Uh, it's about the generosity of the human spirit and of about 7,000 people uh, in the town of Gander, Newfoundland uh, on September the 11th or 12th 2001. Right. And for the subsequent five days. Right. So this was a town that took in 7,000 people 7,000? from 38 planes right. that were diverted to Gander that awful day. Right. You were raised in Detroit. Yes. And what was your family like? Um, I had a Wonderful mother and a very hardworking father. Um, siblings? I have no siblings. Okay. I have lots of cousins, uh, some of with whom I'm very close. Okay. Um, my parents, my father came to this country in 1947, having married my mother uh, in 19, earlier that year uh, in Czechoslovakia. And uh, my mother was American and they came to this country, and I was born 10 or 12 months later. Um, and my father worked in the family business, and it grew, and there were a bunch of men's clothing stores. And the reason it's Red Hanger Productions is because, ask you about that. is because we had Red Hangers in the stores. I was wondering what, yep. where that came That's from. That's exactly where it came from. Terrific. Yeah. Terrific. Yeah. But, I went to, uh, I was born in Detroit. I went, we subsequently moved from that house to a little, a wonderful little suburb called Huntington Woods, Michigan. Um, I went to an elementary school there um, and then went to a junior high school and then went to a performing arts high school in Detroit and had to commute every day from Huntington Woods to downtown Detroit. Name of the school was Cass Technical High School. Then I went to the University of Michigan, graduated in 1970, and moved to New York a couple of months later. So let's go back to Katz, to that performing arts high school. Your family was in the clothing business. Yes. Men's clothing. Yes. So how did you get from men's clothing to a performing arts high school? Oh, huh. Uh, circuitous, I guess, I don't know. Uh, my mother was the person who loved art and music and theater and poetry and literature uh, and music. Did I say that already? It's and, okay, it's, it's bears repeating, it's worth repeating. Right, and so when I was a kid, I wanted to play the piano and I was given piano lessons and my father wanted me to be a virtuoso. Okay. Uh, and I was a damn good pianist um, because I played the emotion of the music. And we can come back to the emotion of the blank a little bit later on in this conversation. Um, so um, there was lots of music in my life. I went to a wonderful uh, camp called Interlaken. Uh, which is in the northern section of the lower peninsula of Michigan. Uh, it's, a summer, it's a summer camp, It's right? a summer camp. Yeah. Uh, I went there for seven summers. Mm. Um, and it, as well as the University of Michigan, helped to create the guy I turned out to be. The art and the culture and the... Uh, communication and the generosity of being able to express yourself 
and wanting to express yourself um, was all supported at Interlochen. Was there any, without trying to sound too cliched about it, was, was there any one thing or one group of things at Interlochen that sticks out that said, oh, wow, yeah, I wanna, this is what I want to do? Or was it more of a, no, of a general? It, no, it was just a general support system. I mean, and I was an, I was, I've always been an artist. I was a painter and a sculptor and a ceramicist. I had a mm. uh, potter's wheel in my basement um, when I was a kid. Um, and then I fell in love with the theater and I was off to the races. There you go. I believe in the theater that we are all storytellers given the fact that I have been both a lighting designer and a producer uh, in my professional career. Being a lighting designer or a scenic designer or a costume designer, a director, a composer, choreographer, we're all just storytellers. And we tell stories from our different points of view. And as a musician, as a pianist, you are telling the story of the composer and you are interpreting it. And that's the same thing that the lighting designer does or the scenic designer does. And it's what the producer does, he, he or she creates the overall communication. And it's the overall way of expressing yourself. And it's all about telling stories. And to me, it's all about telling stories that matter. Correct. Okay, so let's jump forward just a little bit and you're at the University of Michigan. Yeah. And after that you moved to New York City. I graduated in May and I moved to the East Coast in June. I was the lighting designer of Cape Cod Melody Tent in Hyattis, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And then after that I moved to New York. Right. Because they were all warmer than Michigan, I, I take it. Yes. Okay. Anything was warmer than Michigan in the winter. Right. <clears throat> so, lighting designer in Cape Cod. Yes. Job out of the, the one ads or a referral? How did that, oh, man. How did that happen? I, I, I don't remember <laughs> the answer to that question. A couple no. of, more than a couple of days ago. Uh, yeah, it was, a couple, it was more than a couple of days ago. Mm. I, I don't remember how I got that job. Okay. Yeah. I, I resemble that remark. Uh, I, I, <laughs> somehow, out of the back of my head, is a guy's face, and his name was Bruce. But beyond that, I cannot. Okay. He was like the production. I don't know. I, do, I can't. I, I don't know. Uh, can 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 I ask if the working at the, the Playhouse was a pleasant experience? I mean, oh, it was memorable? great fun. It was great fun. Okay. It was a theater in the round and mm -hmm. I did Man of La Mancha and Cabaret and I can't, it's pretty all, good that I can all, remember those two. All of those two. other ones, right. Right, yeah, right, sure. right, right, right. Okay, let's, let's, let's go to New York. Then. Cape Cod Melody Tent. Wow, that name hasn't come out of my head in a very long time. You brought it up. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I did. It's my fault. So from Cape Cod to Manhattan, I assume? Yeah. Okay. So you, you managed to, to land in Manhattan and not in Queens. Well, at that point, you could land in Manhattan. True. True. I mean, my first apartment was $191.36 a month. Right. Upper West Side? No. Bleecker Street. Bleecker. Okay. Bleecker and 7th Avenue. Right. Oh. Yeah, you can't do that now. No. I, I can only imagine how much that apartment costs now. Right. Right. So you're in New York, and you're looking for work, or are you working? I graduated in May. I moved to New York in June. Uh, sorry, I graduated from Michigan in May. I moved to, Hyatt, to Cape Cod Melody Tent in June. At the end of August, I think I drove into New York. I got an apartment and I started going to a very fancy design school. It's the most pretentious name in the world. Lester Polakov Studio and Forum of Stage Design. Right. The people who were my teachers were Tom Skelton and John Gleason and Peggy Clark. That's a name from 
really the distant past. Yeah, yeah. And I studied scenic design, costume design, and lighting design. Um, after my second year at Lester's, I sent no. At the end of my first year at Lester's, I sent out letters to all of the major lighting designers at that point, which was probably, let me see if I can remember this. Um, well, Jennifer Tipton, John Gleason, Tom, Skelton, Theron Musser, Marty Ehrenstein. I kind of think, oh, maybe uh, Jules. Jules. Right. Right. So with whom I've become pals since then. Um, Excuse me, Jules Fisher. Yes, Jules Thank Fisher. You. Yeah, with me. Yeah, get, get I, I, I knew you knew. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and I got a response. I love telling this story. I got a response from Tom, <clears throat> who hired me to be his assistant on a show called We Bombed in New Haven, off-Broadway. And it did. It did. <clears throat> we bombed in New York. Um, and then I got a response from Theron. And the response that I got from Theron was, please come to my house and let's have a meeting. I went around the corner to her house because she also lived in the West Village. And I met her and we sat and talked for an hour. I was not in the union at that point. And she said to me at the end of the hour, the United Scenic Artists United Union. United Scenic Artists, yeah. She said to me at the end of the hour, I would love to work with you, but you're not in the union yet. Please let me know when you get in. And I said, okay. And that was August. And the following January, on a Sunday morning at 11.30, my telephone rang. And the voice at the other end said, hi, this is Theron Musser. And I thought <clears throat> that it was a friend of mine playing a joke. Yeah. And I said, oh, hi, what's new? And she said, well, I'm up here in Boston working on a little night music. And I went, holy shit, this is Theron Musser. <laughs> and um, she said, I'm up here doing night music, and my assistant got sick, and he's, we've sent him home, and I've called all the union people that I can think of, and no one is available. Can you come up for three days and get me through the opening of A Little Night Music? And I said, sure. She said, how soon can you be here? I said, tomorrow morning, she said. I said, soon. I said, what time do you want me to be there? She said, six o'clock for dinner at such and such a restaurant. And I was her, I was hired for three days, and at the end of the third day, she looked at me and she said, you ain't going nowhere. I will figure out with the union how to get you to come in with the show. I said, great. And so that was the beginning of my relationship with her. And I was her assistant from, 19, from January of 1973 through the opening of a chorus line in 1975 uh, at the Schubert. At the Schubert. Yep. I've had a great career. I've, mm. I've had a great career. I'm eternally thankful for what this business has given back to me, mm -hmm. both as a designer and as a producer. Um, very different kinds of things that I have learned. Um, that, that, that brings up something, and we talked about this yesterday. <clears throat> How is it working as a producer with a lighting designer or the other way around at this stage of the game? Oh, now that's, that's an interesting question. The only problem that I have had as a producer was once when I was working with a lighting designer who did not know his stuff. Right. And I would have, it's not, that I'm a lighting designer and know how to do what I do. Um, he did not know how to do what he was hired to do. He was the choice of the director. Um, and 
he and I had, I was very generous to him because he got screwed out of his tech time out of town. And I called him and I said, we're coming into New York and I want you to have the tech time that you got chiseled out of. And I want you to know that you can have any equipment that you want and all of the any equipment that you want because I want you to be able to contribute to this production the way you were not allowed to because of the time constraints mm -hmm. previously. And he chose to pay no attention to what I offered. From a producer, that's a very generous offer. Well, it was a necessary offer. Mm -hmm. And I'm a generous guy if you are generous back to me because I feel that our business is nothing but a collaboration. Right. And if anybody thinks it's anything else, they should get out of the business right now. Um, because the only time that you really get wonderful art is when it is a collaboration. Right. I don't feel that it is the right of the producer to tell people what to do. His, his or her creative people, um, what to do. I feel that it is the right of the producer to ask the artists what they are going for and express your, express my own response to whether they have accomplished that. Right. Um, do you get to offer an opinion when a designer tells you that they are going for this particular yeah, look. Sure. Do you feel comfortable turning to that designer and saying, well, yeah, maybe, but maybe we want to head in this direction. And maybe it's not in the direction that you originally envisioned for the show. Do you feel comfortable yes, having that conversation? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Because I'm an artist. Right. That's who I am. That's where I come from, and I interpret and understand the creative response to a piece of theater and to a piece of writing. It's all about the collaboration, and, it's, and, it, and the collaboration is also all about the communication between the two people. Right. You have to have both. Absolutely right. right. There is a phrase that pops up in the research you know, in interviews and stuff that I've mm -hmm. read of yours, and it's theater that matters. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't ever get explained. What do you mean by that? I think I told you some stuff before we started rolling. I think I told you the story of the two shows, or two of the most important shows that my parents took me to. The first one was My Fair Lady, this, and I believe this one of the other ones was uh, A Raisin in the Sun. Right. Listen, I love entertainment. I love to go to the theater and be entertained. Um, there are a couple of new musicals that I'm working on um, that are only about entertainment. Uh, there's a wonderful new musical called uh, Ain't Too Proud, which is about the temptations mm -hmm. and how they came to be. Um, and it is told with the background of Detroit in the late 60s. Mm. And that show dances. And it dances not only because of the brilliant choreography by Sergio Trujillo, but also by the brilliant lighting design by Howell Binkley, the brilliant uh, projection design, um, and the brilliant scenic design and the way everything is cinematic and it moves and it all dances. I was one of the producers of a Pulitzer Prize winning play called Dis Disgraced. A subsequent play of that author, Ayad Akhtar, uh, is actually opening this evening at um, Lincoln Center and the name of that play is called Junk. 
The reason I fell in love with Disgraced, which I saw out of town originally, is because it, is, it was the 2014 or 2015 version of A Raisin in the Sun. It was, it's about people from a different part of the world and a different class structure and it's all about important things in life. We can't just be entertained all the time. We have to think sometimes. And that's important to you. And that's important to me. I don't, theater is, theater is something that should stay with you after you walk out of the theater mm. itself. It should be something that makes you think about the subject matter. It should be something that helps facilitate conversations with friends. Do you think that that idea, that concept, theater that matters, is mm -hmm. that something that helped you or helped move you, I guess, towards the producing end of the industry? I guess so. I never thought about it like that. You were a lighting designer for you, you, forever. For, for forever. <laughs> um, do you still do any lighting design? Oh yeah. Okay. I just came home from uh, South Africa where I did the uh, Harold Prince production of Evita, where I designed okay. the lighting for the Harold Prince production of Evita, okay. uh, which is going on an international world tour. I believe that the lighting designer is the person who puts all of the elements of a production together visually. Uh, we take the scenery and the costumes and the direction and the choreography and the and we're the ones who focus where the audience pays attention. And we're sure. the ones who, this is a, this is not my quote, this is a Gene Rosenthal quote. That's okay. The lighting designer creates the air that the actor breathes. So how did you make that leap or that move from lighting design to producing? What caused that? I got a postcard it's interesting how your life intersects mm -hmm. and goes apart and then intersects again and goes apart and intersects. I got a postcard from my friend Tommy Walsh, who was the original Bobby in the original production of A Chorus Line. And I was the same age as all the kids on the line, so I was friends with all of them. Um, and Tommy had at that point become a director choreographer in his own right, and I was his lighting designer. So he invited me to see this backers audition of a musical. And I went to the backers audition and I fell in love with it. The name of the show was Idaho! Exclamation mark. It was a spoof of Oklahoma. And it was funny, it was in your face, it was bawdy, it was sexy, it was all of those things, the year before Book of Mormon. Two women, one of whom I knew, had grabbed the rights to it. The one that I knew subsequently called me and said, uh, my business partner and I um, have the rights to Idaho. I know you loved it. Would you like to come help us produce it at Nymph? I said, sure. And so I had to go have an interview with the woman who I didn't know. So I went uptown and had lunch with the two of them. And the woman I didn't know said to me, well, I know how to raise money. Sharon knows how to sell a show. What do you bring to the table? And I said, well, I know how to create the piece of theater that you're raising money for and that she's selling. Right, right. Um, uh, and we did, we did Idaho in the New York Music Festival, and it was a huge success. Um, I, oh, the woman who didn't know me said, have you ever raised any money? And I said, no, but I want to learn. So I raised $28,000 for that little show. Um, and I produced 
the scenic design, the lighting design, the costume design. I picked the three designers. I picked the stage management staff and I picked the backstage staff. And I negotiated with the shop and I negotiated with the scenic, I mean, I negotiated all of the physical production. Okay. And at an, at an opening night party, I met a woman who was about to change my life. Um, that's not true, I didn't meet her then. I met her at a fundraiser on a boat. And her name is Jamie DeRoy. And then at the closing night party, she came up to me and she said, so did you enjoy producing? And I said, yeah. And she said, well, do you want to do more of it? And I said, yes, but on your level. She said, okay, I will call you in, the f in a couple of months when I get the shows for the spring. The party was in at the end of October or beginning of November. And in January, my phone rang. I was out of town. I was designing the lighting for Three Mo Divas. And she called and she said, can we talk about this? And I said, sure. So I said, listen, I'm going to be back in New York tomorrow. Can we have a long conversation about it tomorrow? She said, sure. So the next day, she and I had a conversation, and she offered me four shows. She said, you can do one, two, three, four, or none. Just tell me what you're comfortable with. So the first show she offered me was something called Impressionism. I turned it down. It opened, and it closed four weeks later. Right. The second show I was offered was Desire Under the Elms that Bob Falls was going to direct, that Brian Dennehy was going to star in. And I just didn't think that was going to be a commercial success. The third show I was offered was something called Reasons to be Pretty by Neil LeBute, which was at that point in, rehearse, in previews. And I read, Jamie got me the script and I read the first act and I called her and I said, listen, this is a wonderful piece of theater and it's an important piece of theater. And it's a piece of theater that matters. And so I'm very much attracted to it. But it's a very dark comedy, and so I need to see what the director is doing with it. She said, okay, I'll get you a pair of tickets. So she did, and my partner and I went, and I, 10 minutes into the play, I turned to my partner and I said, this is a great piece of theater, but there's nothing commercial about this. Okay. Um, and the fourth play was uh, The Norman Conquest, which had just been a huge success in London. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's three interlocking plays uh, written by Alan Akeborn that are hysterically funny. You couldn't, it was so successful in London, you couldn't get a ticket to it. They were bringing over the same cast, the same director, the same designers. We were going to put it at, the, um, at Circle in the Square, and I signed on to that. And I started talking and I kept talking, and I had 25, and then I had 50, and then I had 75, and then I had 100, and then I had 125, <laughs> and I had 150. And um, Jamie are. said, so do you have the money? And I said, yeah, I've got all the paperwork here with all the checks, and they're all real investors. So we did, and Ben Brantley gave it a review like I have never read in my entire life. It was an entire page in the New York Times. An entire page. And it was a huge success artistically. Right. And it got me my first Tony Award. Right. That's... And then I just... And the rest is history. Well, then I did La Caja Fole, and then I did a little night music. Oh, right, that's an interesting story. Um, so there was going to be this revival of a little night music and that was going to be done in London. And the woman who was the lead producer of it in London is a woman by the name of Sonia Friedman, who is a breathtakingly brilliant theater producer. She's a genius. And um, she was doing night music. And I, my first show with Theron 
was a little night music, if you remember that right. from earlier. Right. And um, I got on a plane. I wanted that circle in my life. And I got up on a plane and I went to London and I had a meeting with Sonia, whom I had dealt with on, on uh, Norman Conquests, so we knew each other. And I said, well, I'd like to be a producer of A Little Night Music. And she said, I'm sorry, we're all full. And she said, I said, no, 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 you don't understand. I need to be a producer of A Little Night Music because I need this for my soul. And she looked at me and she said, what, what are you talking about? And I explained the situation and she said, okay, you can raise $100,000. And I did. And I got that circle and Sonia yeah. and I had at that point started to forge a relationship. I have invested in her shows in London. I have helped produce her shows in London. Currently running in London is a little uh, is um, Dreamgirls, right? Um, for which I raised a chunk of money, and uh, I expect that to come in in a year or so. Right. And that's my a little night music story. Terrific. Yeah. You've gotten a couple of awards. I have over the years. I have. I have four, I have four Tony four Awards Tonys. and uh, a couple of Drama Desks and an Outer Critics. Right. And, and the four Tonys are for? The Norman Conquest, right. <clears throat> Memphis, The Revival of La Caja Foal, and Vanya Sonia Masha Spike. Right. And Vanya Sonia Masha Spike, I did with my friend Jamie DeRoy. Um, we went to see it at Lincoln Center and I looked at her at intermission and I said, we're doing this. Well, I didn't even need to see the second act. Right. We're doing this. Right. Um, and she and I are going to be working on a couple of things later this season Great. together. So we were just, over the break, we were just talking about art and money yeah. and, and those two requirements. Mm -hmm. You have to have both, right? You have to have both. What you're selling is the piece of art. And the art, the creative artists who are creating that piece of art have to be supported financially as well as psychologically. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't create art unless there's the money to do it. As a producer, um, these days, it seems that there's a growing challenge in getting the younger people, you know, the younger generation, Absolutely. to attend a theater, to attend a live performance. How do you address that? What do you think about it? Well, I think it's a real problem. Kids have the ability to experience things in a completely different way. And I love all the wonderful gadgets that we all have, our iPhones mm -hmm. and our yeah. iPads and our computers and uh, all of that stuff. Um, but it has turned all of us into me people or mm. I people. And part of what we have lost is being in or experiencing the same thing. But there is nothing in the world like the experience of live right. theater, right. nothing. Whether it's a wonderful musical like Come From Away or a wonderful play like Disgraced or 1984, um, there's nothing like that experience right. of having 800 people next to you virtually right. and in a dark theater and watching something happen in front of you live, right there, right then. Shared and in the moment. That's exactly right. right. That's exactly right. Yeah. And there you're right. There's, there's nothing. nothing to compare. Nope. Nope. Let's talk about people coming into the industry for a moment. Okay. New kids, whether they're just graduating college or they have skipped the college phase and they're entering the industry. Right. And stuff. You know, they, they, they look to, to people with the gray hair like us for inspiration uh, or advice. Uh, Follow no. your passion. I am a very lucky man. My passion is my profession, 
and my profession is my passion. Mm -hmm. And it's, I don't go to work. I go to the theater. But um, I never know what the day is. I never yeah. know where it's going to end. Right. So, but as long as you follow your passion. And I do. I do, I have, good. and that's what kids have to do. Because if you don't, you're not being true to who you are. And okay. that can lead to screwing up your life big time. Don't want that. No. Don't want that at all. Not at all. Richard, it's been an honor. It's oh, been a privilege. It's very kind of you. Thank no. you. Thank My you pleasure. Very much. My pleasure.